Station, Houston, are you ready for the event? Houston Station, I am ready for the event. The Coloradoan, this is Mission Control, Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Kevin Dugan. How do you hear me? Hey, Kevin, and hey, Fort Collins. I hear you loud and clear. Welcome to ISS. Well, thank you very much for uh, speaking with us today. We ready to yeah, go? Yeah, absolutely. Always good to talk with folks from Colorado. So it's morning here. What time is it where you are? Well, right now it is 2 p.m., so I think we are about seven hours ahead of you there uh, in Mountain Standard Time. And, uh, of course, yeah, you said it was snowing out there? Is that what you said? No, I, I said it was morning here. It's 7 in the morning. It's a beautiful day in Fort Collins. And where yeah, is... Absolutely. The... It's always a beautiful day in Fort Collins. Yeah. And and where is the where is the space station relative to the Earth right now? Boy, Kevin, that's a great question. Uh, if I actually looked, I'm going to pull up my handy dandy laptop while I have my me right here, because we actually have this fantastic program that tells us where we're at, and we travel so fast around the Earth. I mean, we're circling the Earth every 90 minutes, and um, basically traveling at 17,500 miles an hour. So I will give you your answer in a second because we travel so fast from continent to continent, it is difficult for us to keep up. Not bad. So how's the how's the mission going, Serena? Uh, the mission is going fantastic. You know, it's it's been a very busy mission. It was interesting because we all looked at our watches the other day and said, "Wow, um, we have just passed the 150 day mark for this mission." And we can't believe how fast it has gone um, and just the amount of science that we've performed and how many things have happened. And we've seen one crew already depart us and then another crew was supposed to join us but didn't quite make it. So we've got us three up here right now, but we're doing really, really well. Good, good. And I know there were some challenges or problems with the replacement crew. Um, has that been worked out? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Roscosmos, our partner, has been in the process of a, a pretty big investigation and has been keeping everybody in the loop so far. And they did present a lot of those findings not that long ago. And they are confident that they successfully have figured out what caused the failure to that Soyuz. And so since that time, we have scheduled the next launch for uh, the next crew that's going to be coming up. And they'll be scheduled to launch out of Baikonur on December 3rd. And that'll be Anne McLean, David St. Jacques, and Oleg Kononenko. Oh. So I'm sorry, when, when are they expected to come up and replace you? So they'll be launching on the 3rd, and right now they're scheduled to do uh, what we call a shorter rendezvous profile, a four-orbit rendezvous. So they will actually launch and dock on the same day. Uh, that's in comparison to our flight. When we launched on June 6th, we actually took a two-day ride all the way to ISS. And they will be with us uh, for about 17 days, because right now our crew is scheduled to undock Kazakhstan time uh, on December 20th. December 20th. OK. So you've been and there just since so you know, June. we just departed oh. the east coast of the United States and we're in the Atlantic, heading south. So I asked readers for questions that they might want to ask you, and I got a few responses. Um, and one of them, and I'm sure you get this all the time, is, you know, you've been up there since June. What do you, what do you miss most on Earth or from being on Earth? Uh, that's pretty easy, and that's your family. Um, you know, it is uh, even prior to preparation or to the actual launch of the flight itself, you are in training for about two to two and a half years. And most of that time, you're overseas. Uh, number one, training on the Soyuz vehicle that we fly on and training on uh, the Russian systems and also all of our other international partner modules. And so you're gone from family during that time period as well. 
And then I left Houston at the end of April to prepare for this launch. So uh, I think folks think that when we leave for launch, we go right to Baikonur and launch in a couple days. But it takes a lot of preparation to get ready to that point. So um, I am looking forward to seeing my family and seeing Earth. Yeah, I bet. Well, it sounds like it's been a great experience for you um, professionally. What about personally? I mean, what is what is it like to be up there and... And how can you not just stare out the window all day long, looking at the view? Yeah. Yeah. So it's sometimes, you know, it's funny. Some days you're so busy with all the work and all the science that we're doing, um, you almost don't find time to look out the window. And we do have to remind ourselves to go to the cupola and just stop and take a deep breath and look. Um, personally, a lot of the science that we've been doing up here, um, has been, it's been very personally and professionally very gratifying, especially as a physician, because uh, I feel like a lot of the science we're doing up here does benefit uh, humankind. And so for me, um, that was one of my personal goals when I got up here would be to perform science in those areas, and we've been able to do that. So, uh, And it's not just human science that we perform, obviously. There's everything from material science to technology demonstrations. So it's my day is all over the map when it comes to activities. In fact, uh, today, right before I stepped into this interview, Alex and I were looking at the plants that we are growing in the Columbus module. We're, we're trying to grow some plants so we can have a salad in time for Thanksgiving. And mm -hmm. so we're growing some kale and lettuce right now. And we were checking on those crops. Oh. I know one of the, in reading about your, your interest in your career, that you are interested in the effects of microgravity on the, on the human body and over time. As a physician and as a crew member, have you noticed any differences or any changes in yourself? Yeah, I think absolutely. When you first get up here, uh, it, it takes you a little bit of time to get used to being in microgravity. There, there's this massive fluid shift that occurs and, and goes towards the head. So everybody's head feels a little stuffy. It looks more full. And if you look at a picture of us compared to on the ground, you'll see that fullness and sometimes that red, ruddy complexion. Um, sometimes your nose feels a little bit more stuffy as well. Uh, besides that, those were some of the biggest changes. Um, you know, at first I didn't have much of an appetite. That quickly came back after about three or four days of being up here. And honestly, after a couple weeks, everything felt really normal. My body felt really good. Um, and I felt like I was really back on Earth, except for the fact that I was floating everywhere. Now, we actively work to kind of keep our bones and our muscles strong, and so we do work out up here about two to two and a half hours every day, and that's uh, it's not an option. That is pretty much mandatory for us. Um, mm -hmm. That way, when we return, um, our bones and muscles have stand a much greater chance of getting back to where we were. Hmm. Well, that leads me to another question from our readers. Uh, what do you do for entertainment? Yeah, so actually, um, we kind of have a standing tra tradition. So Saturday night is, is movie night for the crew. And we have dinner together. And then we gather at about 9 or 9.30 PM. And, and everybody gets their chance to pick a movie. And since there are only three of us up here right now, then about every third week, we each get to pick our own movie. And uh, then we also come up with some pretty creative games up here to play as well. I mean, when you're floating everywhere, then you can think of anything. We've, we've got some different toys, some soccer balls and stuff like that as well. So as long as we keep the station safe, um, we come up with some really unique ways to have fun. And mm -hmm. it's just nice to relax at the end of a long week of work because we do have 12-hour days up here uh, mm -hmm. and just relax and talk about each other's families and enjoy a meal together. Do you have much contact with your family? Yeah, absolutely. So we do have programs up here that do allow us to, to pretty much call any cell phone we want uh, at any time of day, as long as we have the satellite coverage. So that's that part is nice. I can talk with my family daily if I want to. And then uh, each weekend, we have a, a video conference so we can see each other as well as hear each other. And that's I think that's very important because just you know talking on the phone is good, but being able to see your loved ones uh, is even better. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know you're a, you graduated from Poudre High School in 93. Do you still have connections? Do you still have connections to Fort Collins? Absolutely. Um, my mother still lives there, and so we try and uh, come back because we love to be in Colorado as much as possible. 
Um, and actually just, I think almost a couple months ago, I, I did a great downlink event with Poudre High School and the yeah. same teachers that I had for chemistry uh, was the one person, Mr. Linzicki, he was the one that uh, helped me organize this event from the beginning. So I can't believe that he taught me was when I was in high school and he's still there teaching and is just fantastic. And so it was really nice to be able to connect with him and some of the other teachers and coaches that I had uh, throughout high school and just reconnect with them again. So that was one of my most favorite events. Yeah, that's nice. Well, along those lines, I, I did receive a note from Steve Shell, who identifies himself as your humanities teacher in high school. And he says that he waves every time you go over in the space station, but you've yet to return that. So he's wondering what's up with that. Yeah, please tell uh, Mr. Shell that I really remember his senior humanities class. It was fantastic. I actually still remember where I sat in that classroom. It just the, the memories are very vivid from my time at Poudre High School. And um, I just had a fantastic time. And so I, it makes me really happy to learn that these folks, um, that they support us so much and they remember. Um, because we as students certainly remember what teachers had an impact on us. And certainly Steve was one of those. Um, amongst many, but for them to remember us as well is, is, is really special because I think your most formative years, some of your most formative years are when you're in high school. And when you draw on a lot of your teachers and coaches for support, certainly with your career and, and where you're heading because you just don't know, and they were just fantastic. Hmm. Were you thinking in terms of being an astronaut when you were in high school? Yeah, in fact, if, if you read my little saying that I had in the Poudre High School yearbook, it says, um, keep an eye out for me in the stars. And I kind of wrote that thinking, boy, I hope this comes true. I didn't know at the time, but I, I've wanted to be an astronaut since I was little. I just didn't know what career path I would take. And that took many twists and turns after high school, but it all ended up working out fine. Yeah. Well, here's another reader question. Um, have you seen any UFOs? Yeah, we get that, that a lot. Dumb. So I'm assuming they yeah, mean I besides bet. my other besides my other crew, but my other crewmates. Um, no, I have not from up here. <laughs> um, you know, actually, what was really cool the other night, um, we were all in the cupola because we had a night pass over Africa, and it was clear, no clouds, and just to see the lights from the landscape. And so Alex, our commander, was kind of looking out one window. I was looking out one window, and Sergey was looking out another window, and at at different times, we would all say something different, and Alex would, would say, oh, I just saw my third meteor. And so I'd look at that window, and I'd miss the meteor. And then Sergey would say something else, oh, well, look at this. And then I'd turn my head quickly, and I'd, I'd miss whatever he was looking at. But it was just such a neat, when you're all three in the cupola looking at the Earth like that, and everybody's silent for a period of time, uh, you realize everyone is just soaking it in, because you may not see this ever again, and it's, it's amazing. Yeah, I bet it is. Well, along those lines, this again, this is from a reader. Uh, she's wondering, being off the planet, being off Earth, how does that make you, does it make you feel differently about planet Earth? I think so. I, a couple things it does. Um, certainly, I've found that when family members or friends send me small videos of their children or, or anything like that playing in a field, I, I find that I'm not so much looking at the people as I am looking at the planet and listening for the wind or listening for the birds, because you realize you do miss that up here. Um, yeah. We are somewhat isolated. It's a wonderful machine that we live in, but those small things, um, you realize you do miss very much while you're up here and how much it means to you. Um, on the other side, and I've said this a couple times to folks, in that we've had a lot of vehicles come and visit us up here, what we call cargo vehicles. And mm -hmm. to look out the window of ISS and see one of these huge cargo vehicles approaching and literally stop and then pull up to ISS and, and we end up capturing it with a robot arm and then parking it just like in a parking lot is amazing. I cannot explain that view to folks on the ground just to actually see that vehicle pull up and realize what our capabilities are up here. It is. I've been training for years and years and years, but you just don't get the true feeling until you're up here and you see it happen. 
Well, it is just amazing to me, the, the work you're doing and, and what an experience for you on so many different levels. If you had the opportunity, would you go back? Would you, would you do this again? Boy, that's a great question. You know, it, this is such a dynamic time up here. I'm really looking forward to see, you know, certainly we've got our commercial vehicles coming up and, um, you know, we've been directed. Certainly the president would like us to return first to the moon and then to Mars. Yeah. And so it is going to be really neat to see yeah. where the space program goes in the next five years, let alone 10 years. So right now I have to tell you, I am focused on doing the best job that I can for this mission. Um, we, we've gotten a lot done. We still have some time to go. Um, but ask me that question again in a few months and I'll let you know. Yeah. Well, do you, do you know what the future holds for you? I mean, what, what is next for you? Yeah, that's another great question. Um, so generally, uh, people say, hey, what happens once you land? Well, our bodies, it takes time for our bodies to get back to I, what I call Earth shape. And so once we land in Kazakhstan and then traverse back to Houston, we start rehabilitation almost immediately. The first six weeks, we spend about two hours a day with special trainers, making sure that our bodies get back to where they need to be. And then also talking a lot with our individual instructors and the different systems experts about our experiences on station and maybe what we would change or what we thought worked really well. So we're pretty busy at work for those first six weeks. And then after that, we try and go out and share our experiences with as many people as possible. So I'm hoping to return to Colorado, certainly to Poudre High School, and be able to see those students that I talked to a few months ago um, up here while on ISS and, and sort of share those experiences. So. That's kind of the, the, you know, the first six months after we land. And after that, we'll see. Yeah. How do you keep up with uh, current events when you're up there? Yeah, so actually every lunch hour, we have the um, news, the evening news, uplinked to us every day. And so Alex and I, and usually Sergey joins us for lunch as well. Um, we all gather around in Node 1, which is where we have our little dining table, what we call the galley. And while we're eating lunch, we play the news from yesterday. So I'd be great if it was the live news right then. And we can actually get live channels if we want to. Um, but having it from just 12 hours before is pretty darn good. And so we tend to watch that. And so we've been following everything about the elections and, and everything that's coming up. And uh, so it's going to be, besides that, we have... They can uplink podcasts, so if we want to listen to certain uh, news shows or, you know, like BBC Network or anything like that, we're able to do that as well. So we, they do a pretty good job keeping us up to date on current information. Yeah. So you're still connected, even though you're 250 miles, right, above the, the Earth's surface, still, still in touch. Well, that's, yeah, that's and you know the funny wonderful. thing is, um, when you look out, when you look out that window, I think the first thing I noticed when I got up here is people say, "Wow, 250 miles, it's so far." It's really not. When you look out the window and look, you can see how close you are to the Earth's surface, and you can see boats in the water if you look closely wow. enough. So, we're closer than you think. Yeah. Well, and I know you. Uh, you can see the the hurricanes and the and the major natural events that occur, uh, I didn't realize you could see man-made things that well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we certainly have a wide array of photography equipment up here. It's really impressive to allow us to be able to zoom in and get some really nice shots, not only of the um, natural disasters, of course, that we try and track as much as possible, um, but some of our favorite things is trying to pick out certain monuments and things like that on the ground. and and get as good a picture as we can with our 800 millimeter lens or even 1600 millimeter. And so it's, it's a pastime of all crew members to take some of the best photography that they possibly can. Oh, I bet. I bet. Well, we're getting pretty close on time. Is there anything you wanted to add or anything that, do you have any questions for me? Well, first of all, what is the weather? Because I know it's supposed to be fantastic fall weather out there right now. Oh, it's very nice. It's a little dry, though. We, have, we haven't had any snow in, in a couple of weeks, no rain. So we're all worried about that. But it's very pleasant fall, about 50 degrees. Yeah, and I think um, one of the things, again, we miss the most, just certainly scenes of Earth and 
traveling around Fort Collins and seeing the leaves change or maybe going up into Estes Park and and just looking at the, the beauty in Rocky Mountain National Park, those are some of my most favorite times, certainly with my family. We do that as much as we can. So if anything, just please say hi to the, the folks, certainly at Fort Collins, Poudre High School. Um, just say hi to Colorado for me. Tell them I miss them. Uh, enjoy this beautiful fall weather, and I'm hoping to return soon. All right. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. I've been looking forward to this interview for several months. And um, I'm glad it worked out for both of us. Absolutely. Very glad we're able to connect from up here. And uh, have a great day. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Thank you to Colorado and participants. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.